we know that velocity, right, when we study velocity, uh, at least mathematically, we see that velocity is not just one value, one scalar value like speed. Velocity is a vector, right? And we define that vector with its uh, components in three-dimensional space. In Cartesian coordinates, right, the XYZ system, we typically call our velocity components U in the X direction, V in the Y direction, and W in the Z direction. That's how we define our velocity vector. And we know that to find the acceleration vector, we can find the material derivative of your velocity vector. And we already defined the material derivative as the combination of the temporal change, we call it local uh, acceleration, and the spatial change, which we call convective acceleration. So this acceleration vector looked something like this, where you had your temporal or local change, and then you had your spatial or convective change. And of course, this is in Cartesian coordinates, right? This is a bit of a review. We introduced the del operator last week, and we saw that there's different ways to use this del operator. And one such way was we could use it to map a vector valued function and essentially turn it into an operator. And with that definition, we could actually simpli write the material derivative in a simpler form, which is this one right here. So these are the two different ways of writing down the material derivative. Of course, when you're down to solve uh, equations, you're going to want to expand it in order to solve for each term. But when it's just about writing it and manipulating the, the expression, you may want to use the simpler form, right? So you don't complicate yourself too much. On that note, we know that the del operator essentially gives out the gradient of a scalar function. So for example, the gradient of pressure is equal to the change in pressure with respect to x in the x direction. Remember, this is a partial change. It's a partial derivative. The change in pressure with respect to y in the y direction, the change in pressure with respect to z in the z direction. We know that there are other operations, right, for which we can use the del operator. Uh, one of those operations was the divergence of a vector field, where we define the divergence of the vector field as the sum of the three changes or the three derivatives in the x, y, and z directions respectively. So the divergence of the velocity vector would look like this. This uh, divergence, the divergence of the velocity vector is what we call the dilatation rate. We also know that we can find the curl of a vector field, and I'm not going to write the whole expression down, I'll just write the uh, determinant, the matrix, but essentially the curl of the vector field can be found by solving the determinant of this matrix. And in the case of the curl of the velocity field, this is what we call vorticity. And finally, we ended our last class by deriving the continuity equation. In other words, we ended by deriving an expression for the conservation of mass that was essentially in differential terms. So it didn't really depend on volume. It depended only on the material and, in other words, the properties of the fluid and the velocity field. And that continuity equation essentially looked something like this, but we use the definition of the material derivative to express the continuity, the, equation, the continuity equation a little bit differently, right? We can also express the continuity equation in terms of the material derivative, and it looks like this. And you use whatever form of the continuity equation is most convenient for you. Now, just as a quick review, if our fluid is incompressible, you know it doesn't uh, compress, right? It doesn't expand or contract. And we already said that if, if a flow 
right? If, if a flow was incompressible, then what does this dilatation rate have to equal if the flow is incompressible? Zero, right? Because this dilatation rate tells us how much is the fluid expanding or contracting. So the dilatation rate has to be zero if the flow is incompressible. If the fluid is incompressible, then that means that the density should not change with respect to pressure. And if there's no varying uh, temperature field, then the density really wouldn't change with respect to time. So we have two conditions, right? If the fluid itself is incompressible, let's say water, then uh, d rho dt equals zero. If the flow is incompressible, and you can think of incompressible flows, any flow with an incompressible fluid is an incompressible flow. However, some flows with compressible fluids can also be incompressible flows. Because you can see that incompressible flow really depends on the velocity field. Incompressible fluid depends on the density. But the key takeaway from this is that both of them will satisfy the condition of d of d, d rho dt equals zero or del dot v equals zero. Because notice here, if del dot v equals zero, you look at your continuity equation, del dot v equals zero, then what does d rho dt have to equal? If this is zero, what, does, what is this equal to? Zero, right? So that means that if my flow is incompressible, my fluid at that flow has to act as an incompressible fluid. And that's what the other way around. If the fluid is incompressible, right? If d rho dt is zero, then you can see that rho del dot v has to be equal to zero. We know that density is not zero, therefore del dot v has to equal zero. So, you know, we, we can say that if the fluid is incompressible, the flow will be incompressible. And we can say that if the flow is incompressible, the fluid will behave like an incompressible fluid. Doesn't mean that it has to be incompressible for every scenario, but it can at least behave like one. Now, we didn't get a chance to do an example last time when we covered the continuity equation. So before we start with today's material, I do want to give a quick example where we use the continuity equation. So this is an example from Chin's book, not from your textbook, so you may want to make sure you take notes. In this example, I, I want to uh, propose this problem in, in such a way. Let's say that you are measuring the velocity field of a fluid. Um, how do you think you can measure the velocity field of a fluid? Let's say you, you're either an engineer in industry or you're a researcher who couldn't get a job in industry, so works at a lab, okay? How would you measure the velocity field of a fluid? Any ideas? Like I say, Chase, Nikhil, it's your job to give me the velocity field of this flow. And I give you, I don't know, I, I give you a channel and I throw some water on it and I want that velocity field. Any ideas? How do you think? Let's try to be creative here. Get a what? A what? Okay, you can Google it. Okay. And if you Google experimental methods in fluid mechanics, you're going to see that one of the most uh, common methods is called PIV, particle image velocimetry. And what that consists of is saying, well, we know from our fluid static section that if an object is denser than water, it's going to sink, right? If it's less, than than less dense than water, it's going to float. What if the density of an object is just like the density of water? It just like stays there, right? Neither sinks nor flows, so it actually just moves with the water. So what particle image velocimetry consists of is having these uh, tiny objects that have the density of water or, or the fluid that you're going to measure, because that way the objects will move along with the fluid without causing much perturbation, right? So if you have these objects and you, ha and you have a little specialized dye to them and then you throw a laser at them, then the laser can pinpoint the exact location of the objects, right, at a specific time. So essentially, you throw these little objects, these little spheres that have the same density as the fluid, let's say water, the same density as water. And because they have the same density as water, they will neither sink nor float. They will just remain wherever they, they're at. So when the water moves, the little spheres will move with them. And that's one way of, of, of measuring uh, velocity fields of fluids. Now, Let's say that you want to measure the velocity field of a fluid, but you're limited in that you only have data viewed from a top view. In other words, I'm going to say that this is my, my volume of flow that I'm measuring. 
this is my surface of the fluid. Let's say it's a liquid, right? Some, some liquid. However, because you're limited in the equipment you have, let's say that you only, you can only visualize, and this is, this is supposed to be an eye, you can only visualize your fluid from the top view, okay? If we're dealing with Cartesian coordinates, I'm just gonna call this my X, so X is normal to the paper, my Y, and my Z coordinate. So if you can only visualize from the top view, it seems like you're only gonna be able to find, right, the two of those three components of the fluid. So if you have your velocity field, your velocity field consists of an X, a Y, a Z component. If you can only look at it from the top, so you're standing on top of the fluid, looking downward, you can only see, you cannot see any motion to and away from you, but you can see motion, you know, normal to your, to your line of sight. So what two components can you get if you're looking at it from the top? X and Y or U and V, that, that both are correct. So let's say that you already determined that your U component of velocity X behaves in such a way and the V component of velocity behaves in this way, but you don't know the Z component of velocity because you can't really uh, measure precisely any movement to, towards and away from you. Now we know that this is a liquid. I wanna call it water, but I feel like we've been using water as our example for the past seven weeks, so it starts to get a little bit boring. So it's a liquid, any liquid. I would like to know what is that Z component. And we're gonna do this using a differential analysis. Now remember, when we first introduced differential analysis, we said that whenever we're solving a problem, whenever we're solving an equation, we need to apply initial and boundary conditions. Initial conditions are conditions at time equals zero. In this case, uh, our flow is steady. Notice that there's no variation with time. So we don't really need initial conditions because not, there's no change with time. However, we do need boundary conditions. So if you look at this system, um, you can tell, right? One boundary condition is that the pressure at the surface is what? Atmospheric, right? However, there's another boundary condition that I think is very important and that we're gonna see a lot when we start to derive our equations. And it's called the no penetration condition. The no penetration condition tells us that if your boundary is a solid boundary, so it's not a porous boundary, it's a solid boundary, then fluid cannot penetrate it. Now, if my fluid cannot penetrate the bottom of this channel, let's call this our boundary, my fluid cannot penetrate it, what is my Z component of the velocity here? If it cannot penetrate it, it has to be zero, right? So for boundary conditions, we can deduce, right, that W, and let's just call this uh, the elevation of the bottom of the channel, let's just call it zero. Let's say it's at the X, Y axis. So we can say that the Z component at an elevation Z equals zero is equal to zero, and that's our boundary condition. So we have our velocity field, or at least two of the three components of our velocity field, and we have a boundary condition. Now, in order to solve this problem, because we don't care right now about forces, it looks like we're only dealing with velocity fields, we may wanna try to use our continuity equation, our conservation of mass equation. You can write the continuity equation uh, however you want. I'm gonna choose the second form, it's just a little bit more convenient for me. So in the continuity equation tells us that the change in density with respect to time plus the product of density times the divergence of the velocity field. And remember that this is density times the scalar equals zero. So what do we know about this equation? Based on this uh, diagram and this given information, what do we know so far about this equation? Does the density change with respect to time if we're dealing with a liquid? Okay, so what happens to this term? Okay. And we end up with rho times the dilatation rate equals zero. Density cannot be zero, right? So the logical conclusion is that my fluid is incompressible, therefore my flow will be incompressible. And we get to our incompressible flow condition or incompressible flow equation which is del dot V equals zero. Now the question would be, is that enough information for us to solve for the Z component of velocity? What do you think, Jose? 
You don't think so? That's okay. Um, let's see. Let, let's see what, what this tells us. So we get uh, del dot v equals zero. We know that del dot v is the divergence of the velocity field. So we have the change in u with respect to x plus the change in v with respect to y plus the change in w with respect to z. And we know that del dot v equals zero. So all this has to equal zero. And now let's see, what do we have? We have the change in u with respect to x. That's a partial derivative of u with respect to x. We know the u component, the velocity field, so I'm just going to write it down, change with respect to x of my u component, which is x squared minus 2y. We have the change in the y component, which we already have with respect to y, so dou dou y of 2xy. And then we have the change in the z component of velocity, which we don't know. And all that is equal to zero. So I want you to look at what we have so far and, 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 and answer the question again. Do you think we have enough information to solve for W now? Yeah. Yeah. Now we do. Okay, good. That's good. So let's go ahead and solve for that Z component of the velocity field. Let's start with our partial derivatives. We want the partial derivative of the X component of the velocity with respect to x. That equation is x squared minus 2y. What's the derivative, the partial derivative of that equation with respect to x? 2x. You're good. So we get that that partial derivative is equal to 2x. We want the partial derivative of this expression 2xy with respect to y. What's the derivative? 2x. Good. And then we have the deriv partial derivative of z with respect to c, all that equals zero. We can solve for our third term and we get that dou w dou z equals negative 4x. Remember, this is, this is a partial differential equation, right? A very simple first order partial differential equation. So let's solve this partial differential equation. If we solve this differential equation, we get that w equals what? Remember, this is a partial derivative, right? So when we say partial derivatives, we assume that everything that's not your z term in this case is a constant. And we do the same when we integrate. When we integrate a partial derivative, then we're assuming that everything that's not a c is a constant as well. So what is the integral equal to? Negative 4xz plus, plus some constant. Remember, that constant, because of the partial derivative, is a function of your other variables, except for c. That's how we solve a partial derivative. Very similar to ordinary uh, differential equations, right? Very simple, similar to total derivatives, except that instead of a constant value, we're going to have a function of the other variables. And how do we find that function? We find it by applying our boundary conditions. So let's apply the boundary conditions. We know that when z equals 0, w equals 0, right? So let's apply that boundary condition. We have our equation, w equals negative 4xc plus function of xy. And we know that if z equals 0, w equals 0. So I'm going to write it down. w equals 0. And this equals negative 4x times 0, which is just 0, plus our unknown function. And what does that function equal to then? 0, right? 0 equals 0 plus our function. Therefore, our function has to be equal to 0. And that's good. That means that we don't really have any variation with respect to x and y in terms of that function. So if our function equals 0, we can then express our z component of the velocity field as negative 4xc plus 0, so negative 4xc. And that's how we use this continuity equation, right, in order to uh, solve for the velocity field or fluid. Now this is all a review of the past two weeks. But I do want to make sure that we understand how to use the continuity equation before we move on. So are there any questions with this material? No? Any questions with solving partial differential equations? Do you understand why we are using a function instead of a constant, which we would normally have a constant? No questions or you don't understand? OK, that's fine. Um, let's pretend that this was an ordinary differential equation. So let's start first solving. If this were just an ordinary differential equation, dw dz equals negative 
four. And because it's an ordinary differential equation, I'm not going to call this x. I'm just going to call this a constant, okay? So this is some constant x, where this is a constant. Okay, so let's start there. An ordinary differential equation, we know the derivative of w with respect to z equals negative 4 times a constant. Okay, so how do we solve this? We solve differential equations, uh, well, there's different methods, but the easiest way to solve a differential equation is through a method called separation of variables. Now, what that tells me is I want to have, in this case, you can see that I have a constant, but I have two variables, w and z. So I want to make sure that all my w's are on one side of the equation, all my z's are on the other side of the equation, okay? In other words, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my dz to the other side so that my w's are on one side of the equation and my z's are on the other side of the equation, right? You have an equation now that consists of two infinitesimally small elements. So what you do is you integrate both sides. Now, what's the integral of dw? Just w, right? w plus a constant, but let's just call it w for now. And the integral of negative 4x, remember this is a constant. So the integral of some constant times dz should be equal to the constant times c, right? Because if this is a constant, I can take it out of the integral. So I just get integral dz, which is just z, right? So on the other side, I'll get negative 4x z plus some constant, okay? That's how an ordinary differential equation is solved, all right? What we have here is a partial differential equation. And here's how that is different. If this is a partial differential equation, this means that I am only looking at the change in my velocity, w, if z is a variable, but everything else is treated as a constant. Because you can see here that my final equation was negative 4xc. I have two variables. However, when I take my partial derivative, I'm assuming that everything that is not z is a constant. Now, because I'm assuming that everything is a constant, my quote-unquote constant of integration cannot really be a constant. We can't say that it will be a constant because notice that if this is a function of x and y, so not a function of c, then the partial derivative with respect to c would still be zero, right? So it wouldn't be included in this partial derivative. So when we are integrating partial derivatives, the difference really, the, the, the main difference between integrating partial uh, derivatives and integrating total, right, or ordinary derivatives is that ordinary derivatives will require your unknown um, value to be a constant, just some value, just a constant value, one, two, three, whatever. But partial derivatives will require your unknown value to be a function, not a constant. And that function will be of every variable except for z in this case. So in this case, x and y, but not z. Now, this problem doesn't matter much because we found that that function is zero. But essentially, whenever we're dealing with partial derivatives, these are squiggly d's, then remember your constant, quote unquote, will actually be a function, okay? We're going to get more practice with that. And I think with more practice, uh, you'll be able to understand it a little bit better, okay? So let's go ahead and start with this week's material. Now, we looked at conservation of mass, right? We had a, an expression for conservation of mass, which was an integral form of that expression. And then we found a differential form of that, of that conservation of mass law. Now, I want to do the same thing now, but with momentum. We've already found the momentum equation. Do you remember that? Sum of forces equals mass flux times change in velocity. You've probably heard me say that equation a lot during the exam, right? Sum of forces equals mass flux times change in velocity. Now, this is an integral equation. So now I'd like to find a differential equation. And you'll see that the differential equation actually looks very different. Even though they're saying the same things, the equations themselves look very different from each other. However, in order to actually study the momentum acting on a fluid particle, we first need to understand what are the forces acting on a fluid particle. So we're going to start today's discussion on momentum by first defining the stress tensor. Now I'm going to draw a fluid particle. And this particle will be located at the origin. So if I have my origin here, in Cartesian coordinate systems, so I have my x 
coordinate, my y coordinate, and my z coordinate. I, I want to say I want to draw a fluid particle that has one of its corners in the origin. So my fluid particle would essentially look something like this. So this is my fluid particle. One of the corners is on the origin. The origin has coordinates of 0, 0, 0. Doesn't look like a cube, but picture it as a cube, an actual cube, OK? The forces that I apply on this particle will be translated or studied as stresses. Now, we've already dealt with stresses before. You may remember when we solved or we derive the energy equation, we had a little bit of a discussion of stress, right? I think I wrote it on the board. We said that we're going to treat stresses as two different components, a normal stress and a shear stress or tangential stress. And we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to say that any stress that acts on this fluid particle is going to have a normal component, but also a shear component. The normal component is normal, right? Orthogonal perpendicular to the wall of the fluid particle. And then the shear component will be tangent to the wall of the fluid particle. Now, because we're dealing in three dimensions, that shear component can be subdivided into its um, rectangular coordinates, right? So that we can always have a, a component for stress in the x direction, a component for stress in the y direction, a component for stress in the z direction. So let's look at what those stresses look like. I know that this is my x-axis, my y-axis, and my z-axis. And in order to identify the faces on this fluid particle, I'm going to give them names, x, y, and z as well. Remember, when we talked about areas, we said that an area vector points normal to the area. And we're going to do the same thing here. The area vector for this face is actually pointing normal, right, orthogonal to that face. So in which direction is the area vector for this face pointing? X, Y, or Z? Normal? Yeah. X. X direction, that's correct. So the area vector for this face is pointing in the X direction. So this face will be my X face. So I'm just going to call it X. In which direction is the area vector? Remember, the normal vector for this face pointing. Y. y. All right, so this will be my Y face. And what about this face? Z, so this will be my z face. On the other side, so I'm going to have my negative x, negative y, and negative z faces, but I'm not going to write those down because it's going to become a little bit too confusing if I just write everything down, okay? So I know that there is a stress. If there, if there is a stress acting on this fluid particle, then I know that I can divide that stress into a normal component and two shear components. The normal component on, let's start with the y face. The normal component on the y face will point normal or orthogonal from that face, OK? If the normal component, the normal stress acting on the y face points normal to the y face, in which direction is that stress moving or acting? Yeah. In the y direction, right? It's normal orthogonal to your face, so it has to be in the y direction, OK? So this will be a stress in the y direction. And then the, the tangential component, which is you know, tangent to this face, we can divide it into x and z components. So I can say that whatever the tangential stress is acting here, I can divide it into an x component and a z component. But now I've got to give these stresses names. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to call our normal stresses. We are going to define them with the Greek letter sigma. And our tangential stresses or shear stresses, we're going to call them tau. Now, in order to identify each normal and shear stress, I will do the following. We know that this is a normal, normal stress, so I'm going to call this sigma. And I'm going to use two subscripts. In the first subscript, I'm going to name the face of this stress, right? And remember, this is the Y face, so my first letter will be Y. 
And then in the second subscript, I'm going to name the direction of the vector. And we know that this vector is acting in the y direction, so this will be sigma yy. Likewise, for this tangential, uh, this tangential stress, I'm going to call this tau. The first letter is the face, right, in which the stress is acting. This is acting on the y face, so this will be tau y. And the second letter is the direction in which this vector is acting. So this will be tau y what? Tau y x, good. And finally, this stress will be tau y z. We can repeat the same process for our z face and for our x face, where we'll have a normal stress, two tangential stresses, ooh, a normal stress, and two tangential stresses. I'm not going to try to fill this up with names, but you know that this normal stress will be sigma xx, right? You know this tangential stress will be tau xy, and this tangential stress will be tau xz. So first letter identifies the face in which the stress is acting on. Second letter identifies the direction. Now, if you combine all of these stresses, we will have what's called the Cauchy stress tensor. The Cauchy stress tensor is a tensor that identifies all the stresses acting on a fluid particle. The Cauchy stress tensor is defined by the subscripts IJ, and it's essentially a second order tensor, that is a matrix, that consists of all of your stresses. So we have our nine stresses in this Cauchy stress tensor. These uh, subscripts will help us identify right, each of these elements within the stress tensor. So for example, I can say uh, tau xy. So you know that you can go to the x row and find the y column, and you get your tau xy, whatever number that is. right? I can say tau yy, so I now have to go to my y row and my y column, and I'll get my normal stress at that location. Now, we haven't dealt with stresses before. I don't think you have in your math, uh, tensors before. I don't think you have in your math classes, but it's not that complicated. A tensor, right? It's essentially this uh, value, right, that consists of multiple values. We've dealt with first order tensors, which we call vectors. Right? First order tensors are vectors because they have magnitudes and directions. So we call a vector a first order tensor because it's really a one dimensional tensor. For example, the velocity vector, if you write it in tensor form, it would just be u, v, w. It's one row, three columns. So it's a one dimensional tensor that gives us a vector. A matrix is a second order tensor. You can see a two dimensional tensor that has uh, values in two dimensions as a matrix. You can have a third order tensor, which is gonna be harder for me to write, and fourth order tensors, which would be impossible for me to write, and so on. But essentially, stress, when it acts on a fluid particle, is a tensor. You, you, we're gonna have to step away from looking at stress as a vector, because it's actually more than that, right? It, it's actually a tensor, right? There's a couple of, um, uh, details about the stress tensor that we can uh, surmise. For example, let's say we're looking at incompressible fluids, and we know that incompressible fluids do not uh, contract, do not expand, right? Their volume remains the same. Now, if you look at this uh, diagram, it seems like normal stresses, right? They essentially relate to pressure. If the fluid is moving, it'll be a little bit more than pressure, but they essentially relate to pressure, right? Normal stress pressure. However, shear stresses relate to shear deformation. And we know that the definition of a fluid is a substance that deforms under any shear stress, right? So we know that shear stresses should be important in the definition of a fluid. There's a fluid property that relates um, the fluid to shear stress, which we covered way back when, about eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago. Do you remember what that fluid property was? A fluid property that was directly proportional to the shear stress or directly related to the shear stress. What do you think? Um, 
if you want to measure fluid's resistance to shear stress, different fluids have different resistances. What do you think, what property do you think gives you that resistance to shear stress? Viscosity. viscosity. Yeah, remember Newton's law of viscosity said that shear stress, I'm going to write it here. Newton's law of viscosity said that shear stress is equal to viscosity times du over dy. So we have a law, right? Or we have a property that actually relates to the shear stress acting on a fluid. And the reason I want to get to that is because viscosity is the resistance to deformation from shear stress, which means that shear stress will deform a fluid, will work to deform a fluid. Now, if a fluid is deforming, but its volume remains constant, right, then we have an incompressible fluid. However, in order for a fluid to deform and have a constant value, then these shear stresses have to meet the following condition. Tau ij equals tau ji. So what does that mean? Whatever subscripts I use, for example, tau xy, has to be equal to the shear stress with the inverted subscript, so tau yx. In other words, for a fluid to be incompressible, tau xy and tau yx have to be the same. Similarly, tau xz has to be equal to tau zx, so these two have to be the same. And similarly, tau yz has to be equal to tau zy. So that's a condition that we meet for incompressible fluids because you'll notice that if we don't meet this condition, then my fluid will deform in such a way that its volume will change. And incompressible fluids, their volume doesn't change. Okay? So that's a little bit of a review of the stress tensor. Now in this class, we actually don't go too deep into the stress tensor. So I think this is about as much as we will know. I did want to share this with you because visualizing the stress tensor will be important in order for us to derive our equation. So it's important to see what forces are acting on a fluid particle. Now, one more thing I want to review before we start with our rigorous derivations is the notion of change. And we've actually talked about this earlier in the semester. You may remember that when we derived the Bernoulli equation, we came up with an expression for change in pressure, right? We said that the pressure at the back of a particle is P, and then the pressure at the front of the particle should be P plus dP dS times dS, right? The change in pressure. Now we're gonna apply the same concept of change here. For example, let's say that I'm looking at my fluid particle, and I'm gonna look at it in the xy phase, okay? So let's say this time that I'm looking at a fluid particle, just to make it simpler, in my x and y directions, so two-dimensional directions. And I have my origin, my coordinate, zero, zero, zero. So, I'd like to define, right, the stresses acting on any area or any face that passes through the origin. I'm going to define those stresses with these names. In other words, the stress here will be a stress acting on the X face, right? The normal stress will be a stress acting on the X face in the X direction. So I'm going to call the normal stress here sigma XX. And the reason I am doing this is because I would like to come up with an expression for the stress acting on the other face of my fluid particle. Now, if we give this particle dimensions, I'm going to say that this dimension is dx, this dimension is dy. Then I would like to come up with an expression for the stress acting on this face of the particle as a function of this stress. So, we know that from my point zero, my x equals zero, to my point dx, the stress has to change by a value of d sigma over dx. Because we're moving in the x direction, the change has to occur in the x direction. So what that means is that the stress on this face, and we did this with pressure, we're just repeating the same process, but with stress, will be equal to sigma xx plus however much my stress changed with respect to the x direction, but remember, this is just a change, right? This is just the rate of change. If we want the total change, we multiply the rate of change, which is your slope, times the amount of change that you had. And in this case, moving from the origin to this phase, how much do you move in the x direction? If you move from the origin 
to this face? dx, okay. So I have an expression for change, and I'm going to use that expression for all of it. I'm not just for the normal stresses, I'm going to use it for the shear stresses in every face. But I wanted to make sure that we're clear on the idea of change, right? If we define our faces that touch the origin as this stress tensor, then the faces that do not, do not touch the origin will have this expression, the initial stress plus the change in stress with respect to a distance times that distance. We're going to do this in the x direction, in the y direction, and in the z direction. And we're going to do this to derive our momentum equation in differential form. So get your notes ready. Make sure your pens have ink or your pencils have... Um, lead. What? Lead. lead. Okay. Make sure your pens have ink and your pencils have lead because we're going to write or derive some pretty interesting equations here. So let's start with the equations of motion. These uh, equations of motion re relate the movement of a fluid particle to the forces acting on that fluid particle. Sometimes they're called the Cauchy equations of motion. You'll notice that they don't just apply to fluids, they actually apply to anything that moves, right? Bless you. But we're going to uh, focus our study on fluids, which we know cannot resist any shear stress movement. Let's study a tiny fluid particle. You, you know the drill, tiny, tiny fluid particle with dimensions dx, dy, dz. If the dimensions of this tiny fluid particle are dx, dy, dz, what is the volume of that particle? dx, dy, dz, that's correct. What is the mass of that particle? I'm going to give you a hint. This particle is so small that it has a constant density rho. So what's the mass of that particle? What? Density, density times volume, right? Because density is mass over volume, therefore mass is density times volume. So the mass will be density times volume, but we already know that the volume is dx, dy, dz. This particle is part of a larger body of fluid. We know that because it's part of a larger body of fluid, it's going to have all of these stresses acting on it. These are what we call impact stresses, right? So stresses that require contact. So contact with its environment produces the stresses in the stress tensor. But what other forces are acting on this fluid particle? Gravity, Gravity right? A body force or any body forces, right? So any forces that are dependent on the mass of the fluid particle, which are called body forces, have to be considered as well. Now, the most common body force that we will use is gravity. We typically don't deal with electromagnetic forces yet in this course. However, I don't want to just sidewind you a couple of weeks from now and say, hey, here's another force you want to add. So I want to make it clear that when I'm studying gravity, that's just one of the many possible body forces, okay? It's just that here on Earth, that's the one that we experience the most, so it's the one that we're going to include. So we know that there is a gravitational force acting on this particle. That gravitational force is commonly called its weight. And we know that its weight is equal to the mass of the particle times a gravitational acceleration vector. Now, I don't want to assume that my x, y, and z axes are going to be somehow aligned with the gravitational vector. So we typically say, you know, z is vertical, therefore gravity acts in the z direction. Let's not make that assumption because that won't always apply to us. Let's assume that x, y, and z are at are some arbitrary inclination. Therefore, we can't say that gravity acts in the z direction. It will always act downward, right? But downward doesn't have to be z. So the reason I'm doing this is so that we can express gravity as a vector with three components, an x component, a y component, and a z component. And if we do that, it will allow us to understand how other body forces that don't depend on our z elevation then come into play. So we know that the gravitational force is mass times gravity. And we know that mass is density times volume. And we know that gravity will be equal to a vector that has an x component, a y component, and a z component. So that's our weight. 
This is not the equation that we're going to derive, by the way. This is just what we can see from just looking at this particle. Okay, we found its volume, we know its mass, we know its weight. So, let's apply the law of conservation of momentum. The law of conservation of momentum, typically uh, we start with Newton's second law of motion. Does anyone remember what Newton's second law of motion says? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was hoping that somebody would remember it. Yeah, forces, sum of forces in a body equal mass times acceleration or the change in momentum with respect to time. This particle has a constant mass m, right? So Newton's second law of motion, which says that sum of forces equals change in momentum with respect to time. If my particle has a constant mass, I can take mass out of this derivative and I get mass times dv over dt. And we know that this is equal to mass times acceleration. And that's Newton's second law as we have learned it in our introductory physics classes, right? F equals ma. So let's apply this law into this uh, particle. The, this law deals with vectors, right? We, we have vectors here. Um, so let's try to simplify it. We know that this law can be broken down into three components. An x component, which I'm going to write as mass times acceleration in the x direction equals sum of forces in the x direction. A y component and a z component. So we can, we can break down this equation into its three components and just deal with one component. That way we're not, we don't have such a long equation, such a long derivation. So let's start by trying to come up with an equation that gives us Newton's second law of motion, but only in the x direction, okay? So in the x direction, we have mass, times acceleration of my fluid particle equals the sum of forces acting on the fluid particle. What was the mass of the fluid particle that we uh, came up with? Thank you. Rho, dx, dy, dz. Now we're looking at an acceleration. However, our purpose is always to relate everything to the velocity field. So how can we relate this acceleration to the velocity of the particle? How is acceleration related to velocity? Yeah, derivative of velocity with respect to time, right? So we know that acceleration, and I guess I'll have to write it down here. We know that acceleration is dv dt. And in this case, we're only looking at the acceleration in the x direction, which means that we only want the derivative of the velocity in the x direction, which we call u. So mass times acceleration in the x direction equals rho dx dy dz, derivative of u with respect to time. Up to this point, right, we have the left side of the equation done. Are there any questions on how we got to this, these values? All right, so now let's go to the hard part. Sum of forces. Let's consider all the forces acting on this fluid particle in the x direction. And I'll show you the stress tensor just so you may remember. Out of these nine forces, there's uh, 18 in total, right? But out of these nine stresses, the ones that we can actually see here, which ones are acting in the x direction? Three, right? What, which three? Mm -hmm. Yeah, tau yx and tau zx, I think is what you meant, right? Now, it's okay because we know that for an incompressible fluid, they'll be the same, but just let's just make it clear that it's tau yx and tau zx that are acting in the x direction. Good. So we have three in these three faces, and then we have the other three in the back faces. So let's try to write those down. I mentioned that I want any face that's at my origin to have the name sigma xx, tau x, whatever, and any face that's away from my origin to use a change equation. So let's start with the sigma xx. When we're looking at this fluid particle, you notice that the front face, the one that acts in the positive x direction, is actually the one that's away from the origin, right? So we know that the stress here will be sigma xx plus the change in stress with respect to x times dx. So change sigma xx with respect to x times dx. 
Let's make sure we write these down correctly. These are partial changes. This is just a differential element. So this is a normal D. These are squiggly Ds. This is acting in the positive x direction, as you can see here, as you can see here. So it will have a positive value. However, this is a stress, and Newton's second law of motion applies to forces. How can we turn this stress into a force? How can we turn any stress value? Think of pressure. How do we turn pressure into a force? We multiply by the area, right? So we want to multiply this stress by the area where this stress is acting on. And what is that area where this stress is acting on? Remember, this is dx, dy, dz. So what's the area? dy, dz, right? Remember, the stress in the x direction is going to act on this face. In this face will have dimensions of dy, because this is in the y direction, and dz, OK? So let's write that down. dy dz. So that's one stress, one force. We have another force on the back of that fluid particle. So if you look at it here, it's actually going to be on the way back, right? And we know that on the back of the fluid particle, it passes the origin, so I'm just going to call it sigma xx. We have to multiply it by the area, which is dy dc, the same area. But then because it's acting on the back of the fluid particle, will this stress be positive or negative? Negative. negative. OK. So we've accounted for our forces acting, our normal forces resulting from normal stress. OK? But there's more forces, right? Um, Smit already mentioned that there's three of these stresses acting in the x direction, which means there should be a total of six of these forces acting in the x direction. So what do we have? We know that we have tau, a shear stress, tau yx. And because this is acting away from the origin, I'm going to use, oh, and because this is the one that's away from the origin, I'm going to use my change expression here. So this will be tau yx plus the change in tau yx with respect to y times the distance. And from the origin to this face, what is that distance? From here to here, what's that distance? dy. That's correct. And of course, we multiply this by the area where that stress is acting on. So what's the area of this face? dx, dz, right? dx, and then dz. Good. Hopefully, you'll start to see a pattern here so that we can solve the rest pretty easily. So tau yx, dx, dz. Same reason. The front one is positive, the back one is negative, right? They have to have different signs. And finally, we have our tau zx plus the change times the distance multiplied by the area of the face, and then the same stress but acting on the back, so in the negative direction. So here I have a total of six forces that result from shear stresses acting on my fluid particle. Am I missing any force acting on this fluid particle? We have our six shear uh, stresses, right, expressed as forces. Is there any other force that we've talked about that acts on the fluid particle? Gravity, right? So we do need to include gravitational acceleration. And we know that this is equal to rho dx dy dz times gxi, gyj, gzk. Because we're only looking in the x direction, we only want the x component of this vector. So this will be rho dx dy dz times gx in the x direction. So that is the equation of motion for this fluid particle in the x direction. Now, is there a way to simplify this equation? Yes, of course there is. Let's do some math to figure that out. Notice that this is, uh, you know, this is a factorized equation. So I can multiply dy dz times these two terms, right? So if I get sigma xx times dy dz, and I have minus sigma xx times dy dz, what does that give me? Zero, right? So really, I can cancel out these 
terms, right? And end up with just dou sigma x, x dou x, dx, dy, dz. Does that make sense? So we multiply them both, and then we see that the sigma x, x dy, dz cancels with sigma x, x dy, dz. And we end up with only the change in stress. And I hope you see why that's relevant. Um, let's say that I am applying a force. Not that. Let's say that I'm applying a force, right? I apply a, a force and I, I express that force as a pressure, right? And I apply the same magnitude of force in the other direction. So I'm applying two pressures. If my two pressures are the same, will this box move? No. It's actually when my pressures are different, right? If I apply a bigger force on my blue pin, then my box starts to move. When my pressures are different, that's when motion happens. And that's what we're seeing here with this equation. We don't care about the actual sigma xx. That's why I call this sigma xx, because I'm calling it whatever, right? It can be anything. This can be something. It can be a fish. It can be anything, right? Because the initial pressure is not what matters. What matters is the difference in stress. And that's actually what's going to make this fluid particle move. And you'll see that the same applies here. We have tau yx multiplied by dx dz minus tau yx multiplied by dx dz. That is 0. So it cancels out. Tau zx dx dy minus tau zx dx dy, 0. Cancels out. So what I end up with is a far more simplified equation. Sorry? We're, we're going to get it. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Don't worry. Now, you can see where we're going here, right? You can see that pattern there, right? So let's see what the equation looks like. We have on the left side my mass. times my acceleration and on the right side I have my change in stress I remember that this was dou sigma over dou x times dx times dy times dz so times dx times dy times dz my change in normal and shear stress, tangential stress, times dy times dx times dc. I'm just going to say dx, dy, dz. Change the order so it's, it's a little bit more recognizable to us. My change in tangential stress times dx times dy times dz. And finally, my gravitational force. We derive these differential forms, this, these differential equations. We derive them so that we can express these equations independent of the geometry of your fluid particle, of your control volume. In other words, we don't want to deal with the size and the geometry of my control volume. So what can we cancel out of this expression in order to not have to deal with our geometry? Uh, the, volume. the volume, right? Because the volume, if we cancel it out, then whatever equation we get will apply to any fluid particle of any size, regardless of that volume. So if we divide both sides by the volume, notice that dividing this by dx, dy, dz, we divide this by dx, dy, dz, dx, dy, dz, dx, dy, dz, dx, dy, dz. And that lands me at a simplified equation in the x direction, right? Which is rho times the acceleration in the x direction equals my change in stress in the x direction plus my change in stress in the y direction plus my change in stress in the z direction plus my gravitational force. And this is what we call the Cauchy equation of motion for the x direction. We can repeat the same process for the y and for the z directions and land at pretty much the same equations. Okay? So I'm going to write down what those equations look like. We're not going to do the derivation again. You can just see it here.
And these are my equations of motion. You can see that from a simple or simplish analysis of Newton's second law, we end up with what looks like somewhat of a complex equation that governs the motion of a fluid particle. And it does so by relating the velocity field of that fluid particle to the forces and stresses acting on that fluid particle. Up to this point, are there any questions? of how we arrived at these equations of motion or what these terms actually represent. Is the order of that term is important? Can you say that again? Is the order of the term is important? Is like I, I just like to write it this way okay. just so that it matches my stress tensor. Okay. That, that's, all, that's just all it is. So in, in this case, where, is my, where did my paper go? Oh, here we go. Um, I wrote my stress sensor in this way, yeah. so I want to make sure that they kind of match the same. That's just a personal preference okay. on, on my end. Any any other questions? All right. Before we finish today, we still have about a uh, little bit over 10 minutes. Let's see if we can use these equations of motion to actually derive an equation that we can actually use. Okay, so these are the equations of motion. They're very general. They apply to any fluid particle experiencing any type of stress. But let's try to look at a specific right type of flow. Does anybody remember Euler's equation that we derived in class several weeks ago? It was an equation that related a change in pressure with changes in velocity and changes in elevation. Now, when we derived that equation, we essentially used a, an integral formulation to come up with the equation. And that was great, but that left us with an equation that essentially only exists or can only be used in terms of differences, right? Differences in elevations, differences in velocities, differences in pressure. So what I would like for us to do today is to derive this Euler's equation using the Cauchy equations of motion. And you'll see that we're going to land at what looks like a much more clean equation, but that still relates everything to changes in velocity, changes in pressure, changes in elevation. So let's derive Euler's equation. Now Euler's equation was an equation for ideal fluids, right? So if you had an ideal fluid, you may recall that ideal fluids were those that we described as incompressible. That is, no change in density with respect to pressure. And also inviscid. That is, no viscous effects. So we're going to try to derive a form of Euler's equation for an ideal fluid using these equations of motion. When we're doing this, um, I would recommend that we start with our stress tensor and see what that looks like. So just as a recap, my stress tensor essentially consisted of my stresses, both normal and tangential, acting on a fluid particle. You don't have to write this again. I'm just writing it here for reference. However, if you look at the stress tensor and we know that we're dealing with an incompressible fluid, what can we deduce? Well, in, an incompressible fluid tells us that tau xy will be equal to tau yx, tau zx will be equal to tau xz, and tau yz will be equal to tau zy. We, we know that from incompressibility. But what if we're dealing with an inviscid fluid? An inviscid fluid is a fluid that has no viscosity. And viscosity was defined as a fluid property that relates the movement of the fluid to the shear stress. From Newton's law of viscosity, tau equals mu times the velocity gradient. If there is no viscosity, if viscosity is zero, what does the shear stress have to be? Zero. Which means that for an incompressible, inviscid fluid, all of my shear stresses 
will be zero. Now for an inviscid fluid, again, if there is no shear stress, there is no viscosity, then that means that the normal stress only depends on one property, right? Normal stresses are a combination of pressure and, vis and pressure effects and viscous effects. But there is, if there's no viscosity, then normal stress will be only what type of stress? Pressure, right? So for an incompressible inviscid fluid, my shear stress, uh, my stress tensor actually becomes my normal stress in the x direction, which is just pressure. Now for a fluid particle, right, a small particle, is the pressure acting on one side equal to the pressure acting on all, all the sides? Because it's a small fluid particle. So think of the pressure at a point. Is the pressure the same at every direction in a point? Yeah, yeah it has to be. Which means that we don't really have a pressure in the x direction. No, it's just pressure. Now, we, we always say that if our property is, flo is flowing into the control volume, it's a negative sign. If it's out of the control volume, it's positive. Pressure acts into my control volume, so I'm going to call it negative P. So my stress tensor becomes very, very simplified if our fluid is incompressible and inviscid. This is my stress tensor. Negative P, not, 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 negative P, not, 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 negative P. A pretty easy stress tensor to memorize for an incompressible inviscid fluid. So now let's see what the equations of motion look like. And I'm not going to write them again in the interest of time. Let's just use this. In the x direction, I get rho du dt. If my fluid is incompressible and inviscid, does that change anything from this side, rho du dt? If the fluid is incompressible and inviscid? What do you think? Density is what? If it's incompressible, density is constant. Okay, so the only real thing that changes is that my density is a constant term. Other than that, it remains the same. Let's look at the right side. Based on this new stress tensor that we're using, how does the right side of the equation change? Okay, so we know that this sigma xx is actually going to be negative p, right? So this is just the change of negative p with respect to x. What about this term? All the shears become zero. Same thing happens in the y direction, right? We're going to have my shear stresses become zero, and my normal stress becomes negative p. Same thing in the z direction. My shear stresses become zero, and my normal stress becomes negative p. Like I mentioned earlier, I like to write these in this order so that they match the stress tensor because now you see that we essentially have the stress tensor mapped out. Negative P, zero, 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 negative P, zero, 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 negative P. Okay? So now my equation becomes far more simplified, right? In the x direction, I have rho du dt equals, I'm going to factor out that negative 1 because it's a constant, so negative Exactly. Change in pressure with respect to x. There's a zero, there's a zero, and then I have my gravitational force. In the y direction, this becomes rho dv dt equals negative change in pressure with respect to y plus gravitational force. And in the z direction, I have rho dw dt equals negative change in pressure with respect to z plus gravitational force. Now these are all scalars, but now you, we, we can see that we can actually turn this into a vector uh, quite easily, I would say. Um, we can add all of these terms in vector form. So in vector form, I can have rho du dt. This is in the x direction, so I want to multiply it by my i vector plus rho dv dt, j component, plus rho dw dt, k unit vector, equals, and I have the same thing on the other side. I have negative change in pressure with respect to x in the x direction, in the y direction, in the z direction, in the x direction, in the y direction, in the z direction. And finally, I can factor some things out, right? Here I have rho 
ddt, right? It's an operator, so I can factor out the density and the operator, and this just gives me rho d over dt of ui plus vj plus wk. All this equals, I'm going to factor out my negative 1 here, just so that I don't have all these uh, subtraction signs. So I get negative... And here I'm going to factor out my density, so plus rho And finally, one more change. What is ui plus vj plus wk? What does that represent? The velocity vector, right? So this is actually just density times the material derivative of the velocity vector with respect to time equals. We have the partial change of a scalar field in the x direction the partial change of a scalar field in the y direction, partial change of the z direction. What, what was this called? Gradient. The gradient, right? So I have negative the gradient of my pressure field. And then I have rho times gxi, gyj, gzk. What does this represent? Gravity. The gravity vector. Good. So finally, after some minor manipulation, we have arrived at Euler's equation in differential form. I think you can compare this with the Euler equation that we derived in the integral form. Notice that in integral forms, we said that the Euler equation, first off, we derived it in terms of a streamline. So we weren't looking at x, y, and z components. We were only looking at streamline components. But then we found that the Euler equation in integral form was a function of a change in pressure, which is what we have here, a change in elevation, which is what we have here, and a change in velocity, which is what we have here. So Essentially, what this tells us is that we can actually use Euler's equation but not limit ourselves to streamwise coordinates because this equation actually applies to Cartesian coordinates. And we don't have enough time to actually work on an example using Euler's equation today, so I'm going to stop class here and we'll continue this topic on Thursday.